Up next on U.S. Bank Business Watch, presented by the Cincinnati Business Courier, tearing down the old to make way for the new. The granddaddy of Cincinnati's startup network. It's nodding over the Rhine, and it's nearly 25 years old. And this UC Dean is offering his graduates a 100% job guarantee when they graduate. U.S. Bank Business Watch is next. Good morning. Welcome to U.S. Bank Business Watch. I'm Brian Patrick. On the Business Courier front page, the centerpiece this week, Meet the New Neighbors. Some of the newest homes in Cincinnati are popping up in the city's oldest neighborhoods. Developers, builders, and real estate agents say our city is experiencing a surge in infill residential development. That's when buyers or builders acquire houses, knock them down, and build new ones in their place. Since 2010, hundreds of homes have been torn down and replaced by new construction. And like most things, there are advantages and disadvantages. The advantage? This reduced suburban sprawl, strengthens existing neighborhoods, and provides a needed boost for the construction industry. But teardowns are complicated. They're time-consuming and expensive. And they don't work everywhere. So far, these deals have been limited to Cincinnati's strongest neighborhoods, places where buyers are willing to pay the premium to get a lot. Montgomery, Madeira, Hyde Park, and Indian Hill have been the most infill active. Well, the trend is spreading to Mount Lookout, Oakley, Wyoming, Columbia, uh, Columbia Tusculum, and Fort Thomas, as well as Amberley Village. For more on this trend, reporter Tom Demeropoulos joins Business Watch producer Kelly Leon in the studio. Tom and Kelly. Thank you, Brian. Tom, it's always good to have you here. Good to be here. That was a great, great story. Really interesting. So talk a little bit about what is causing this trend. There are a number of factors that come into play here, Kelly. People want to be part of a neighborhood, first and foremost, and that's what we're seeing people really uh, jump back into areas that have a strong uh, neighborhood feel to them. And people aren't as interested in going out farther and farther for that long commute to get uh, to get the bigger house. They want walkability, they want nearby restaurants and amenities, and they want to feel like they're part of something. Yeah. But what about the cost to do this? I've seen this, um, I live in the Hyde Park Mount Lookout area, and I've seen this a lot in Hyde Park where they'll come down and they'll build a house like right in front of another house. What what is the cost associated with doing something like that? It can be very expensive. Uh, essentially, you're competing with the uh, for sale market. These are homes that are perfectly fine. Um, someone could buy it and live in it, and it'd be a great house. But uh, people are, are buying the lots, so they're paying that premium. Yeah. So in some cases, in neighborhoods like Madeira, these are homes in the 150 price range and up. Uh, in areas like Hyde Park, it can be $600,000 and up to buy the house. And then there's the additional cost of tearing down the home yeah, and building a new building. one. What's the been the reaction of neighbors? Uh, the neighborhoods, I think, are, are getting a benefit from this. This is investment in their community. This is people that uh, care about these neighborhoods. They want to mm -hmm. be there. They like the schools. They like the amenities. Um, so this is an influx in, uh, in development and, yeah. uh, and good neighbors for them. Okay. All right. Great. Well, you got to read the full story in the print edition. It's a great story, Tom. Thanks so much. Brian, back to you. A very interesting trend. Thank you. One of the oldest neighborhoods on Cincinnati's west side is undergoing a transformation of its own. City and community officials symbolically smashed a wall to kick off the $4 million renovation of the Price Hill Recreation Center. It will be replaced by a new fitness center, a new pool, and a renovated gym. And this is just the latest big Price Hill project. There's a $50 million incline district development underway with businesses and homes. And there will be a $3 million streetscape along Price Avenue, and even more to come. Hey, all of this ties in with the development of our Incline Business District, which is essentially going to link our traditional business district on Warsaw Avenue over to Price Avenue and connect into the area around uh, Queens Tower, where we're developing the new Incline Theater. The Price Hill Rec Center will be closed for a little more than a year as construction gets underway. A Columbus developer plans to buy three historic buildings in downtown Cincinnati, turning them into apartments. 
Peak Property Group and Westward Development are under contract to purchase the buildings on West 7th near Ray Street. Some of you may know the Mill and Drapery Building at 26 West 7th. The plan is to build 75 apartments in the three buildings, 45 one bedrooms, 32 bedrooms, and 15,000 square feet of first floor retail space. Now, unlike most of downtown apartment projects, the developers say they're not targeting the luxury apartment market. The rent is expected to range from $700 to $900 a month for these units. And as the Business Courier was first to report this week, the Pendleton neighborhood near the casino is being targeted for a huge new development. Broadway Square, a $26 million residential and retail project, will start later this year in this area just north of Horseshoe Casino, Cincinnati. Coming up later in the program, we'll talk with Bob Maley, CEO for the Model Group, the development team that is undertaking that project. Startup incubator The Brandery graduated a new class of nine startups last week at its annual Demo Day. Demo Day is where the entrepreneurs get to show off the results of their intensive four-month program in creating a brand-driven company. It's a preview before sharing it with hundreds of potential investors from all over the country. To date, The Brandery has had 26 entrepreneurs come through the program. Uh, this was really the first time we had kind of a deep enough stable of entrepreneurs that could support each of the startups going through the program. So each one of the, the 10 companies that came through the program had mentors who went through the program previously. They know what it's like to build a business in Cincinnati. They know what it's like to leverage the Brandery ecosystem. Uh, it was really exciting to see them help each other out and, and, and pull for each other. The Brandery has been able to draw startups from all over the globe and bring them to over the Rhine. In fact, this year's class included only one startup from Cincinnati. The hope is that some of the companies grown here will actually stay here. And with all the buzz about startups in Cincinnati, we thought it would be a good time to revisit our area's oldest business incubator. The Hamilton County Business Center has been chugging along for the last 24 years in an old manufacturing complex and office building in Norwood. It includes office space that can accommodate more than the 50 companies, conference rooms, a co-working space, and areas for laboratories or even manufacturing. Its goal is to help entrepreneurs secure funding, launch their companies, and create jobs in Hamilton County. A typical business? They're usually between one and three people do not have any revenue as of yet, but have an idea and have a plan. And then we work with them from there. We're not looking to see how fast something goes. We're looking to see how solid we can make a company. The center started in 1989 after the nearby General Motors plant closed. Since then, it has graduated more than 120 companies that generate about $200 million in revenue a year in the state of Ohio. Hundreds of entrepreneurs, investors, and innovators were in Cincinnati last week for the first Everywhere Else Cincinnati Startup Conference, focusing on startups outside of Silicon Valley. Here are five takeaways from the conference from our reporter Andy Brownfield. One, you can learn a lot about branding from soap. Two, work hard. Three, have other passions. Four, don't listen to your insecurities. And five, be unconventional when approaching investors. If that got your attention, you'll get more details in Andy's story in our print edition. I'm going to have to read that one. Michelle Selnick was working in sales for a large printing company in 1996 when she realized the future potential of the Internet, someone with real vision. Selnick took a job with an Internet company in Los Angeles. She wrote out her business plan while living in her hotel room and then in 1998 came back to Cincinnati to start WebFeet, that's feet with an A. According to its website, WebFeet is Cincinnati's leading website design and web development company. Selnick's advice to new business owners, don't get frustrated, know there are a lot of growth opportunities. And I think it's important for a new business to, dis to determine what their business strategy is before they launch the company to really have a firm idea of their strategy and the implementation that they intend to have for that strategy. Selnick also emphasizes the importance of a good mentor. The job market is tough for most recent college graduates, but a new dean at the University of Cincinnati is very optimistic for his students. Neil McKinnon oversees the College of Pharmacy at the University of Cincinnati. The number of jobs for pharmacists is expected to increase as the Affordable Care Act extends health insurance to millions of Americans next year. There's no mistaking McKinnon's confidence in his program. 
So all of our graduates find work within the first six months of graduation, and the salaries are quite good, uh, depending on the field, over $100,000 annually. And getting into UC's program isn't easy, though. McKinnon says for 100 positions, he receives about 500 applications. Speaking of the Affordable Care Act, it took effect October 1st and is blamed in part for the government shutdown. And with so many people seeking information about the new health exchanges, the system has been on overload. It was difficult to access. We have partnership with Interact for Health, formerly the Health Foundation of Greater Cincinnati for the past few months, with tips to help businesses leading up to the launch. Kate Keller from Interact for Health joins us to answer one final question. Kate, how many employees need to participate for a small business to be eligible to buy plans through an exchange? At least 70% of employees offered coverage must enroll in order for you to buy insurance through the small business insurance exchange known as SHOP. Employees with coverage through another employer plan or Medicare, Medicaid, or the military veterans programs are not included in this calculation. To help estimate, employers may want to find out from employees ahead of time if they're interested in health coverage. You can find more information or ask questions about how health care reform will affect your business at reform.interactforhealth.org. All right, thank you, Kate. We appreciate you and our partnership with Interact for Health. Up next on U.S. Bank Business Watch this morning is barely October, and holiday shopping hours are already being debated. And Kroger gets the go-ahead to grow. Here's some news you might have missed if you're not reading the Business Courier online every day. How early is too early to begin holiday shopping? Macy's is reportedly polling its workers to see how early they'd be willing to work on Thanksgiving Day. Nothing's official yet, but there are reports that Macy's may open at 8 p.m. Thanksgiving evening. Last year, Target opened its doors at 9 p.m. Walmart, Sears, and some Toys R Us stores greeted shoppers at 8 p.m. Frankly, I think that's too early. But who cares? There's apparently money in tires. Tire Discounters is spending millions of dollars remodeling its retail locations across greater Cincinnati and the Midwest. The company's existing stores will be updated inside and out. In some cases, the existing stores will be demolished to make way for Tire Discounters' store of the future. The company will easily spend more than $10 million as it renovates its existing locations. P&G plans to build a plant in Westchester that will employ more than 200 people. IM Flux was created to develop new plastics processing technology for injection molding. The company is headquartered at P&G's Beckett Ridge Technical Center. The site of the plant has yet to be determined. A shareholder vote late last week gave Kroger the go-ahead for its deal to buy North Carolina-based Harris Teeter supermarkets. Harris Teeter shareholders overwhelmingly approved the $2.4 billion deal. Cincinnati-based Kroger still needs to get Federal Trade Commission approval to complete this acquisition. Kroger will add 212 supermarkets, mostly in the South. Some significant changes in the Dow Jones Industrial Average last week. Some companies dropped, some were added. To talk about it and give us some perspective in this morning's U.S. Bank Economic 360, we are joined by our friend Mike Deneman, who is U.S. Bank Vice President and Senior Portfolio Manager. Mike, I'm so glad you're here to talk about this. Good morning, Brian. We all watch the Dow. I check it on my smartphone several times a day, but I don't know what constitutes the Dow. Give us a snapshot. Sure. So it, it is at base, of course, a stock market index, so a gauge of how the market is performing. Uh, it's, as you say, very widely known. We hear about it on the news every day, and certainly one of the oldest. It dates back to 1896, and it gets its name from the Dow Jones Company, the publisher of the Wall Street Journal. Um, it is important because it represents some of the largest, most blue-chip companies in, in the, the U.S. Names we've all heard of, Procter & Gamble, Coke, Microsoft. Uh, it even retains one of the original 1896 companies in, in General Electric. But it's a very narrow slice of the market, only 30 stocks out of the thousands that trade. But it gets a lot of notoriety because of the importance of the companies that, that constitute it. So is it safe to say that it has changed or morphed over the years? 
Come uh, in. Yeah. And why so now? Why the changes now, do you think? Sure. Well, I mean, if you looked at the complexion of the, the, the index 50, 60 years ago, it would be completely different. Of the 30 companies, you'd have a handful of steel companies, a lot of heavy industrial. So very much a rust belt type of economic picture. Fast forward to today, and you find the Dow still has some heavy industry in there, but more technology companies, more retail and consumer-oriented companies. So a challenge for Dow Jones is to keep the index relevant, and that's why we see them make some minor adjustments from time to time. Although last week's changes were notable because at the, the sheer number of them, six, three companies in, three companies out, for the, such a small index is, is a very large number. In fact, it's the most changes we've seen in a decade. Yeah, that's significant. So, here's the big question. Who got the boot? Who's invited in? Sure. So, we, we've got a graphic that, that shows uh, the, the uh, six changes. So, the, the companies going out are Alcoa, Bank of America, and Hewlett Packard, and then Goldman Sachs, Nike, and Visa coming in. So. In some ways, this is you know changing out of the old guard. Alcoa, for instance, has been in the index since 1959. Uh, it also is you know a removal of some companies that have perhaps lost some luster in recent years. HP, for instance, has really struggled with the declining PC market. Bank of America naturally has had some trouble in the wake of the financial crisis, and it's a continuation of that shift away from the sort of rust belt mentality. When you swap out an aluminum company for an apparel company. You know, it's pretty clear what's what's going on there. So, on the flip side, you look at the names coming in, like Nike, Visa, perhaps perceived to be more cutting edge, certainly more marketable. Um, probably didn't hurt their chances that they are more appealing to a, a younger demographic. But I think what Dow Jones is saying is, although we still call this an industrial I was average, say it's not industrial anymore, uh, is it? That's right. It's more yeah. it's more reflective of an economy that's become centered around the consumer. All right, they want to know upstairs if they should buy Twitter. <laughs> That's not on the Dow Industrial. It's not. No. All right, Mike, we appreciate that. Very good clarification. Still to come on U.S. Bank Business Watch this morning. Cincinnati's urban renaissance continues. We'll get a sneak peek at the new development coming to this neighborhood, neighborhood near the Horseshoe Casino. And congratulations this morning to Eric Langevin, another of our 40 Under 40 honorees. He's Assistant Division Director of Hawksworth Blood Center UC Health and proudly notes that he is the same age as Star Wars. Thanks a lot for joining us this morning for U.S. Bank Business Watch. In our Business Insight, as we reported earlier, new development is coming to a part of town that's been pretty run down for quite a while. Here are some renderings of Broadway Square, a $26 million residential and retail development project. Construction is expected to start in mid-November in the area just north of Horseshoe Casino, Cincinnati. This is Pendleton, a small neighborhood just east of Over the Rhine. The first phase of Broadway Square will include 40 thousand square feet of one and two bedroom apartment units, 11,000 square feet of retail space. In November 2011, the Business Courier reported that the Model Group had acquired property near the casino with this project in mind. Model Group COO Bobby Maley joins Business Courier publisher Jamie Smith for more on the project. Jamie and Bobby. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for being here today, Bobby. My pleasure. I think as most viewers or a lot of people are going to think this is all happening because of the casino, but I guess this has been going on with the model group for some time. Talk a little bit about the foresight you guys had or yeah. what drove you to that area. Well, I think it's you know, always better to be lucky than good. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if it was foresight, but uh, you know, we actually had most of these parcels under under contract in 2007, okay. which was well before the casino uh, came. Uh, although we're closing, it's taken us a while to get to closing, and I think the infrastructure improvements, the lighting, safety improvements uh, that have, the city has invested in and uh, that have come from the casino have really given us a boost. Okay, so it, it, we didn't buy them because of the casino, but certainly the casino's uh, improvements around the casino are helping us get off the ground. And it's definitely going to help, I'm assuming, with the, you know, getting people in those buildings, right, when these apartments start? Yeah, I, I've talked with Kevin Klein, the GM for the Horseshoe Casino, and he's excited to have some apartments within walking distance that his employees can uh, possibly rent and live in. So uh, we think that's a target market. Well, the part, you guys were able to uh, be eligible for some tax credits as well, as I understand. Is that right? Yeah, we, um, 
these are old historic buildings and they're tough. Uh, they, we, we did receive federal and state historic tax credits. Okay. So that was a, that was a big part of our, uh, of our investment that we needed to get going. We're also eligible and received from PNC Bank and Cincinnati Development Fund part of their new market tax credit allocation. Oh, excellent. So that was a, another huge boost for us this summer that it's finally uh, going to let us get going. So when you talk about this development and you, you think of all the other developments that are going on in Cincinnati, the banks, uh, over the Rhine on Vine Street and Washington mm -hmm. Park, what's this similar to or is it similar to any of this? Well, I think Pendleton, if you know the neighborhood, it's, a, it's got its own flavor. It's mm -hmm. a little bit different. It's certainly not like the banks, so I, I think we're really not much of anything like the banks. Uh, a lot more intimate, and there are some areas that would be similar around Washington Park, although you know, what's happening on Vine Street and in that area, is, is a, it's a pretty heavy retail district, which okay. is exciting. Uh, Pendleton's a little more quiet, a little more residential feel. And we'll have some boutique shops and some restaurants, pubs certainly, but uh, uh, we'll have its own little flavor. Okay. And the apartment, uh, the uh, you know the tenants, the, the people you're looking for, a little different than what they're looking for in a lot of the apartments downtown as far as cost. Yeah, we're not going to have swimming pools or things like that. Uh, these are walk-ups. There's no elevators, so we can keep our rents down a little bit. Uh, we won't be competing against the the really high luxury apartments that you're seeing developed in the central business district. Well, that's great. Yeah. Well, I look forward to it. I know it's starting in November. I guess phase two slotted for October of 2014. That's right. So, I mean, you know, you just go through Cincinnati and things are happening and I'm so glad to see this project coming off as well. Yeah, it's exciting. Well, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Back to you, Brian. All right, Jamie, Bobby, thanks. An ambitious project there. Thank you for joining us this morning for U.S. Bank Business Watch. We will be back next Sunday and each Sunday morning, 6.30 here on Local 12. And if you get up a little bit later, 10 a.m. on the CW. For more business news during the week, be sure to visit the Business Courier online. It's real simple to sign up for our daily emails, which you'll want to be getting in your inbox. Our address, CincinnatiBusinessCourier.com. For all of us here at U.S. Bank Business Watch, I'm Brian Patrick. Have a great Sunday and a good week. Thank you.